Hey guys, so we're back now to talk about uh, the endocrine diseases. So we're going to start with diabetes mellitus. And diabetes mellitus is just a Greek word for fountain and Latin word for honey. So that's the way you can kind of think about it. And I have a little schematic that I found here. So just something to look out for when we're talking about diabetes is some of the symptoms that people can present with are hunger, unexplained weight loss, numbness or tingling in the hands and feet, and of course uh, frequent urination. Or polyuria so what is diabetes exactly diabetes is primarily a disorder of carbohydrate metabolism and the symptoms that we just spoke about mainly result from a deficiency of insulin or from cellular resistance to insulin's actions and the principal sign of diabetes sustained hyperglycemia or increased blood sugar levels which results from impaired glucose uptake by cells and increased or excuse me and from increased glucose production so high levels of blood sugar and that results from impaired glucose uptake by cells and from increased glucose production too much produced now the manifestation of diabetes again how people can present so polyuria or frequent urination polydipsia frequent thirst keto uh, nuria which is ketones in the urine as well as weight loss Okay, so why is this diabetes thing so bad? Well, it's because hyperglycemia over time can lead to detrimental and actually fatal uh, consequences. So some of these can include heart disease, renal failure, blindness, neuropathy, amputations, impotence, as well as stroke. So as you can see, diabetes is something that definitely needs to be managed. And in terms of screening and reduction, so this is here, I just wanted to take a second to digress for a little bit and explain the importance of getting better at diagnosing. So a lot of people out there in the world, in our communities, towns, or cities, who are diabetic don't necessarily know that they are. Because again, uh, in terms of the symptoms that arise, those don't necessarily come at the point when you're when you would be considered diabetic and there's of course something called pre-diabetes which we'll talk about in a little bit but just we as healthcare professionals you all as nursing students or anyone out there who's just planning to become a health provider we have a role in assisting and bettering our screening process and as well as our risk reduction and this can be done by just staying active in the community in terms of uh, screening people at different fairs, health fairs, they could be at hospitals, just giving people free screenings to see where their blood sugar stands and if they're at higher risk to kind of just educate them on this. And of course, that's ultimately the reason why we're all in this together, correct? We want to be better providers and help patients with better outcomes. So by helping reduce the risk by screening patients early on or even get, um, showing them the warning signs and everything. This can be a great way to reduce uh, the, the, the prevalence of diabetes. So thank you for letting me just speak a little bit about that. So how does hi, uh, this whole diabetes thing happen? Well, there are two hormones that are in the body that we need to think about, insulin and glucagon. When blood sugar is high in the blood and the pancreas then releases insulin, it stops the release of glucose from the liver and helps the uptake of glucose into cells. So that's insulin's action. Insulin decreases blood sugar ultimately. So when blood sugar gets too low though, pa the pancreas releases something called glucagon, another hormone. Glucagon increases blood sugar and it tells the liver to basically release the glucose and blocks uptake of blood glucose molecules or glucose molecules uh, into the cells. So in diabetes, insulin is not working very well to decrease the blood sugar and glucagon is working too well to increase the blood sugar which is very unfortunate and therefore ultimately the cells start to starve now there's uh, to differentiate between the different types of diabetes so what we want to talk about is type 1 and type 2 not necessarily gestation or any other ones that you might hear of in the future or maybe you've heard of in the past but just some of the things to look out for I think is just think type 1 diabetes 1 comes before 2 one, patients are younger. 
Younger patients are mo the most likely to be seen with type 1 diabetes at, t at the time of diagnosis. So the usual onset of age is under 20. They're usually lean. They look pretty normal outside of the fact that maybe they're urinating frequently and ketosis prone. So meaning that they can have that, um, they can be that, they can uh, produce ketones in their urine or whatever it might be, as well as just... Um, yeah, again, it's like an autoimmune type diabetes. So type 1, you think of just a child that's thin, that looks quite normal. and But in terms of looking at their blood sugar, you'll see abnormally sky high blood sugars at specific times of, um, of drawing their levels. Now type 2 diabetics or type 2 diabetes, you this is what we would think of as diabetes is probably just a general population. So people who are overweight or obese, above the age of 40, the onset is not so fast that's something that takes time and not necessarily you wouldn't necessarily find ketones in the urine or ke they wouldn't be really keto uh, ketosis prone and more common in minorities than the majority and again with type 1 diabetes though it's predominantly caucasians or whites so those are just some things to look out for now pregnant type 1 diabetics type 1 diabetics that become pregnant there are some recommendations out there for them and experts on diabetes in pregnancy advise that blood glucose levels must be monitored six to seven times a day with those who are pregnant with type 1 diabetes because these patients must be managed and monitored very very closely because hyperglycemia has a teratogenic effect or may otherwise harm the fetus and of course we don't want that so because it can cross the placenta and it because it because it has these teratogenic effects we want to keep the blood sugar levels low when uh, monitoring these type 1 diabetic pregnant patients. Now some relevant values, I kind of just have them listed out here. I'm guessing a lot of you know them, but something to just kind of look at is on the right hand side here, it talks about A1C. So this is not very frequently discussed in uh, physiology or previous classes you might have taken, but this is something that we really use in hospitals and in the healthcare, in our current healthcare system, because it is probably, um, the most accurate way to kind of look at okay how well has this person uh, this patient's blood glucose been controlled the last few months so normal level of a1c below 5.7 percent a pre-diabetic would be considered one if they're about 5.7 to 6.4 percent and usually in terms of diabetes if you want to diagnose it an a1c of, of over 6.5 percent and of course this can go up as high as 11 12 13 i've seen anywhere even higher, 13, 14 percent. So, just to kind of look out for that. Okay. Now, the drugs for diabetes mellitus—they're all listed here, and it'd just be a mouthful for me to kind of just word vomit. But just something to look at is the insulin preparations. So, there's different insulins. It's not necessarily that their content is different. It's all insulin, yes, but their duration of action is what we have to look at. So, insulin Lispro, short duration, and it's a rapid acting type of insulin. Irregular insulin which is short duration, slower acting insulin. NPH, insulin is intermediate duration, so in between, and then insulin largine is the long duration type insulin. So make sure you look at these and keep commit them to memory because it's really important to know if a patient's on one or the other, when to expect that insulin to start working. So please do learn and maybe commit those to your memory, those four there. All right, and then of course there's the metformin or the oral um, hypoglycemic or it's an oral medication to decrease glucose production by the liver and increases tissue response to insulin and of course there's the sulfonylureas which promote insulin secretion by the pancreas metaglinides that promote insulin secretion by the pancreas and uh, pioglitazone for example as the glitazones decrease insulin resistance and decrease glucose uptake alpha uh, glucose yeah, excuse me. The alpha glucose glucon glucosidase inhibitors. That was tough to say. <laughs> the glucose glucosidase inhibitors delay carbo digest carbohydrate digestion and absorption. Then the gliptins, those enhance the activity of incretins and thus increase insulin release. And an example of those is uh, acetagliptin. And lastly, the sodium glucose cotransport two inhibitors. And again, this is a lot of words. Just kind of look over them 
you don't necessarily need to memorize those, but again, just the insulin preparations are the one you should look out for. But yeah, the sodium glucose co-transport, the co-transporter inhibitors uh, that increase glucose secretion via urine by inhibiting SGLT2 in the kidney tubules, and that's canagliflozin. It's the example that I listed here. Now, if blood sugar is too high, we said that's an issue. But if blood sugar is too low, that's also an issue. And hypoglycemia, which is blood glucose below 70 milligrams per deciliter, occurs when insulin levels exceed insulin needs. How do we know? Think fight or flight. The sympathetic nervous system is usually innervated or activated during times of hypoglycemia. So this is something that you can tell your diabetic patients to look out for. And how do we treat hypoglycemia? If your patient is conscious, give fast-acting oral sugar. Because their blood sugars are too low, so let's just give them some sugar. So glucose tablets, orange juice, sugar cubes, honey, corn syrup, soda. Anything that you can find that would be a high dose of sugar, that would get in quickly. Now, if the patient's unconscious, though, IV glucose or glucagon would be used. Because what we say glucagon does helps release uh, blood sugar. Correct? So that's something that we can also give an IV glucose. Now, again, in terms of thinking about fight or flight, when to tell the patient, just think about the fight or flight responses. So increased heart rate, palpitations, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, drug interaction note. So beta blockers can delay awareness of the response. Uh, of, excuse me. They can delay awareness of and response to hypoglycemia by, mistake, uh, by masking signs that are associated with stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, like tachycardia and palpitations that I mentioned just a second ago. And hypoglycemia normally causes these beta blockers. Remember that we talked about in previous chapters, they decrease your heart rate. So if you're a hypoglycemic or if you're a diabetic that's experiencing hypoglycemia, but you're also on a beta blocker, that can be an issue. So of course, there are other signs that we can ask them to look for if they're on um, the two concomitantly, but of course we try to avoid that um, just altogether when possible. Now, ketoacidosis, and this occurs when the body can't produce enough insulin. So you become in this ketoacidotic state or an acidotic state. And the signs to look for are confusion, acidosis, so just a decrease in pH below that 735, 745 range, fruity scented breath, and I've actually seen this, and it smells just like gummies, or I don't know. It's just that it's really that fruity scent that you can smell. Shortness of breath, weakness or fatigue, nausea, vomiting, high blood glucose levels, and I'm talking like four or five hundred in terms of high levels. So again, we said normal range is between eighty to one twenty ish, but high, I'm talking triple that, and that's what you'd see when someone is experiencing ketoacidosis. And ketones in the urine, of course, are a very, um, a very it's a very easy way to kind of read or find out if someone is uh, keto acid. If they have ketones in their urine, they're probably having some potentially ketoacidosis and then polydipsia or excessive thirst. So let's go some, through some cases really quickly here. A uh, type 1 diabetic patient was in her third month of pregnancy. What would be the ideal testing schedule for her? So would you say every hour from sunrise to sunset, once in the morning, once at night, six, six to seven times a day? or three times daily. Just give you a couple seconds to think about that one. All right, so if you said 67 times a day, you are correct, because that is what the uh, guidelines tell us, and that's what um, diabetic or diabetes experts have told us as well. Because again, hyperglycemia has teratogenic effects, and we wanna just make sure that patients are monitored very closely while they're pregnant, if they're type one diabetics. Now, a patient with type 1 diabetes is also taking propranolol. Propranolol, remember, is a beta blocker. What is concerning about this? The beta blocker won't work. The beta blocker can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. I am not concerned about this at all, and the patient will be just fine. And it might cause hyperglycemia. So I'll give you a couple seconds to think about that. So if you guess the beta blockers can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia, you are correct. Hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia causes sympathetic nervous activation. Therefore, we can see things like increased heart rate and palpitations, but beta blockers decrease heart rate, so that's something that we need to um, keep into consideration. All right, now a patient comes into clinic for a blood glucose test. 
we check his or her level to find that the level is at 145 milligrams per deciliter. What do we tell them? We tell them that you're diabetic. We tell them that you are not diabetic. How about come back at a later time? Or ask if the patient has been fasting for eight hours, and if so, they will need a repeat test to confirm a diagnosis. I'll give you a couple seconds. And if you guess D, ask the patient uh, if they've been fasting for eight hours, and if so, they'll need a repeat test to confirm diagnosis. You are correct. Because we can never just say, if we get one blood glucose reading out of just a random um, blood glucose reading, that can't really tell us what's going on. Because if someone just had breakfast that can affect blood glucose levels someone just had a soda or whatever it might be a sweet beverage a snack that can increase the blood sugar which is a normal response in the body anyway all right so which of the following tests for diabetes has to be checked every three months to assess diabetic control so i didn't really touch on that so i'll kind of give you guys the answer for here but it's not it's a glycosylated hemoglobin the hba1c is what we use in practice and in clinics to assess diabetic control Okay. Now, which of the following is true with regards to insulin enlarging, which is dosed once daily at bedtime? Short duration rapid acting, short duration slower acting, intermediate duration, and long duration, or long duration, excuse me. Give me a second. All right. So if you guessed long duration, you are correct. That is insulin enlarging's um, action. It's it's a long duration type of insulin. Now we're going to move on to the thyroid disorders, and this is pretty much our second to last. So I'm just going to quickly fly over to thyroid since you don't really know need to know too much about it. But the thyroid hormone functions. There's three main functions that we need to talk about: stimulation of energy, stimulation of the heart, and promotion of growth and development. So how does the thyroid hormone function? How does the thyroid do this by modulating the activity of specific genes is how these hormones do it now the hormones we want to talk about there's t there's t3 that penetrates to the cell nucleus and binds with high affinity to nuclear receptors which will in turn bind to specific dna sequences and alter genes there's t4 and it does the exact same thing as, as t3 but at a much lower affinity than t3 does and does not cause gene transcription alteration so that's a big key difference there between T3 and T4. And lastly, there's TSH, and this acts on the thyroid, to, thyroid excuse me, to stimulate all aspects of thyroid function. Thyroid size is enlarged, iodine uptake is augmented, and synthesis and release of the thyroid hormones are increased. It's all a part of this negative feedback loop, which is in the next slide here. So the TSH levels are increased, correct? And increased levels of thyroid hormone signal hypothalamus to stop secreting the TSH. So if there's too much, it tells us to stop. If there, and that's how this whole negative feedback loop works. So increased levels of thyroid hormone tells TSH, TSH to stop. Because what do we say TSH does? It increases thyroid hormones by secreting them. So that's what, or helping them, uh, to, it helps produce them. So that's what we block here. Is this with this negative feedback loop now the effect of iodine deficiency in terms of the thyroid if we do not have enough iodine production of thyroid hormones decreases drop in thyroid hormones promotes release of TSH right which acts on the thyroid to increase its size which causes what is called a goiter so there's a presentation of a goiter right there you can kind of see it's a bulge there in the middle now, how do we test for thyroid function? So we can take a serum TSH, serum T4, or serum T3 test. And there's some reference values here about normal uh, normal levels, as well as hypothyroid or Hashimoto's, Hashimoto's, and then there's hyperthyroidism or Graves. So hyperthyroidism, too much thyroid hormones. Hypothyroidism, not enough, too little um, thyroid hormones. Hormones or TSH. And then we could look here. And just pay attention though, TSH, so in terms of hormones, hypo and hypers, that's how they're classified. But in terms of TSH, it's the opposite. So if you have too much TSH, you're considered hypothyroidism or hypothyroid. And if you have too little TSH under 0.3, you're considered hyperthyroid. So 
what I like to think is just, I think in terms of hormones, too little hormones, too little hypo thyroid, too much hormones, hyper. And then in terms of TSH, it's just the opposite of that. Now the medications. So the drugs for hypothyroidism, we use levothyroxine. So levothyroxine is a synthetic preparation of T4 identical to the natural occurring hormone. So that's literally what we're giving. You don't have enough hormone? Here, we'll give you some um, synthetic preparation of it. Now drugs for hyperthyroidism, there's methmazole and PT or propyl or propylthiouracil or the thionamides and methmazole uh, methmazole blocks synthesis of thyroid hormones and two things it does this by doing two different things it prevents oxidation of iodine and prevents iod um, iodinated tyrosines from coupling together now this is something that I bolded and you should definitely know <laughs> for your exam PTU or the propylthiouracil is the mainstay for thyrotoxic emergencies and has uh, a thyro a thyrotoxic emergency can kind of be classified or a patient can present with hyperthermia severe tachycardia increased heart rate restlessness agitation and tremor of course this can indicate a lot of different things but yeah just keep this in mind here all right now the glucocorticoids there's two main effects that the glucocorticoids are used for physiologic and pharmacologic physiologic so modulation of glucose metabolism are elicited by low doses of glucocorticoids low doses physiologic now suppression of inflammation are elicited by high doses of glucocorticoids and this one we have to use um, pharmaceuticals or uh, this is their pharmacologic action now there's different uh, steroids that I listed here on this chart or I didn't list I found this chart and just something to look out for is the different potencies and their anti-inflammatory properties in terms of just specific uh, specific things you don't need to know like the details but just kind of like appreciate the difference between cortisone's anti-inflammatory properties versus dexamethasone as you can see that's not 10 that's 20 40 fold difference there so just keep that into consideration and therapeutic uses <laughs> this is only just a few of them but there's a bunch so rheumatoid arthritis systemic lupus um, IBD or inflammatory bowel disease different inflammatory disorders allergic conditions or allergic rhinitis asthma dermatologic disorders cancer suppression for transplant patients and so on and so forth the list can go on for a long time and everything good of course has its bad so in terms of glucocorticoid adverse drug reactions that can occur or adrenal insufficiency because again the adrenal glands are where they are produced for their physiologic type of responses osteoporosis all right infection glucose intolerance myopathy fluid and electrolyte disturbances even growth delay and physiologic disturbances in general so it is something to definitely keep into account all right moving on to our final piece of the endocrine module and we're going to talk about birth control all righty so a little exciting end with a bang here the non-pharmacologic type of birth control so there's surgical sterilization so tubule litigation and vasectomy mechanical devices like condoms diaphragms and cervical caps and then of course avoiding intercourse during periods of fertility like the calendar method temperature method and the cervical mucus method now there's different pharmacological types and of course it's a pharmacology class so I'm just gonna go through those there's the oral contraceptives uh, the Etonorgestrel implants, injectable medroxyprogesterone acetate, the intrauterine devices, vaginal rings, as well as the transdermal patches. Now, efficacy of user-controlled contraceptive options. So I like this chart because this kind of tells you, okay, so most of the time when you see these things advertised, these different types of uh, pharmaceutical or pharmacological types of birth control, there's... They always advertise them as perfect use. So oral contraceptives being 99%, uh, male condoms being 98%. That's what we hear, but typical use is what you should kind of be looking at actually instead. So oral contraceptives, 92%, male condoms actually being 85%, a diaphragm, 84%. So you can kind of see the ovulation method, 78%. So perfect use, it could be 97, which is great, but most people don't really know what they're doing in that sense. 
So 78%, that's more like it. And remember, this, these percentages are relative because it's already a low percentage of a, of a specific female getting pregnant, but you're adding this percentage over that. I know it's kind of confusing, but yeah, just understand that these percentages are kind of probably still under. Uh, they're not really giving accurate percentages. Okay. So the mechanism of birth control medications. So combined oral contraceptives. So there's the ethanol estradiol norethadrones and the progesterone only pills, which are like norethadrone. There's the long acting contraceptive, so the subdermal. Either um, norgestrel implants or the implantations, and then there's the depo provera, which is the depo medroxyprogesterone acetate, and then of course drugs for emergency contraception like nevo norgestrel. So Plan B and One Step is what you probably heard of. Um, there's the Ella as well, and then ethanol estradiol, levo norgestrel, and there's of course those name brands that are there as well. And the mechanism of action of these how they actually work is combined oral contraceptives reduce fertility by primarily inhibiting our uh, ovulation now the estrogen and combination oral contraceptives suppresses release of fsh follicle stimulating hormone from the pituitary and therefore inhibiting or inhibits the fl uh, follicular maturation of them the progesterone in combo oral contraceptives act in the hypothalamus and pituitary to suppress mid-cycle luteinizing hormone or lh surge which normally triggers ovulation and therefore leads to pregnancy. So blocking that is another way we can do, or another way we can um, use oral contraceptives to stop pregnancy. And lastly, secondary mechanisms, including thickening of cervical, uh, cervical mucus, so creating a barrier to the penetration of the sperm to the egg and alteration of the endometrium. So plan B, emergency contraception is defined as contraception that is uh, implemented after intercourse so it can be used to prevent pregnancy following unprotected intercourse which can result from sexual assault contraceptive failures or broken condoms or other reasons so what's inside these plan b medications well plan b consists of a high dose 1.5 milligram tablet of levonorgestrel a progesterone found in many combination oral contraceptives but just at a much lower dose so kind of keep that into uh, consideration so you can't use your oral contraceptives like take a bunch of them and therefore have this listed the same effect that plan b does because again they're combined oral contraceptives so if you need emergency contraception you have to use something like plan b or one step because it has just that levonorgestrel component and that progesterone only so plan b must be taken 72 hours after um unprotected uh, intercourse however though it can still be effective when started up to five days after. You don't want to tell patients that, but yeah, 72 hours would be best practice. Of course, the next day or day of, that would be ideal. Now, last but certainly not least, let's just talk about erectile dysfunction real quick in the next two slides. So erectile dysfunction is defined as persistent inability to achieve a sus and sustain an erection sustainable for satisfactory sexual performance. And this actually affects 30 million men in the United States. So it's associated with chronic illnesses, especially like diabetes, hypertension, and depression. And related to age, 4% of men are affected in their 50s, 17% in 60s, and then 47% of men that are 75 and over have an issue with this erectile dysfunction. So we do have medications that can rectify this problem for most patients. But just something real quick before I move on to the next slide is, uh, so uh, something you can kind of think about as a healthcare provider, a strategy, would be to kind of talk, for example, if you have a male patient that has a chronic illness and you can talk about the manifestation of this illness can cause erectile dysfunction. So for example, if a, if a patient's diabetic, they might not really care to uh, manage themselves very well. They're just like, oh, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I don't mind. I don't mind, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, high blood sugar levels is not really affecting me or I don't care if my kidneys go bad. But if you talk, if you talk to a male and say, hey, this can, this, this can potentially cause issues with your sex life, they will quickly jump on whatever medication regimen they give you. So just a selling point maybe and a way to kind of just get to your patient. All right. And now the medications for ED. So the PDE5 inhibitors, and we talked about this in the cardiovascular module. So there's like sildenafil. And of course, which medication do you not take this with? Give you a second there. 
yes, if you said, if you thought to yourself or thought or said nitrates, so like nitroglycerin, you are absolutely correct. We never take those two together because of that extreme hypotension side effect that can occur. Now, the non oral drugs for ED. So there's the, um, I mean, you don't really have to know these, but yeah, peppervin and phentilamine. So just those combos or those medications are used, but they're not very commonly used. And then the drugs for benign prosthetic hyperplasia are the five alpha reductase inhibitors and the alpha adrenergic antagonists like tamsulosin. So yeah, just the big thing here is about the seldenafil and the PDE5 is what I would be worried about. All right, that's all, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me today. Bye-bye.